crisis devolving. Does it feel safe right now? No, no. Haiti's emergency, Florida's focus. Stay inside, but you're still not safe. Too much problem. The more we allow the gang members to take over the country and be successful in their plans, the bigger um, security risk that we have to our country. The only Haitian American in Congress is from South Florida and with us here live. Here we go. Tough new laws. This is not a new operation for us. Florida borders and those who cross them. There are federal dollars dedicated for that, so there doesn't need to be any state charge for any of the things that we're talking about. I, I, speaking I mean, this is going to be on the news, you and you guys have to Mr. Mr. Bouquet, the rules apply to you no. and by as the way, they no. do to us. Small town surfside, big drama. Now, elections in the city that took center stage for a building collapse, now famous for fighting and finger pointing. For him to sit up here and talk about unity and just want to remind people what they went through over the last two years before we got it. That kind of toxic, hateful stuff, that's the thing that people who are losing resort to. Both candidates for a mayoral rematch are right here with us live. The big news of the week and the newsmakers all live this week in South Florida. Good morning, hello, hello, and welcome. I'm Glenna Milberg. With elections already underway, Surfside's simmering tensions have blown up to South Florida-sized drama. And the issues and the controversy in this tiny town are a window and a pattern so many South Florida cities are experiencing. The candidates for mayor face-to-face -face are with us later, though we start today with the international crisis that is now very much a South Florida story. Right now, a scramble to staunch the street Street violence in Haiti's cities and neighborhoods help the people whose families are watching from here helpless and brace for the possibility of a Florida bound mass exodus. The first flights of a UN air bridge between Haiti and the Dominican Republic this morning are complete and to get that is to get in humanitarian aid. The U.S. Embassy is working to fly American citizens home. Evacuations made difficult without an open airport. Sheila Scherfelis McCormick is currently the only Haitian American in Congress. She is a Democrat representing a big part of Broward and Palm Beach counties and is, as you see, right here with us today. Congresswoman, it is great to have you at the table. You've been with us via Zoom, but so great to have you here. Thank you for having me. You've been very vocal this week about uh, events going on. You've called on the prime minister to resign. He did. He said he would yes. soon. Uh, a trans, a transitional government, which is a plan in the works. And you've called on a multinational force to go in, another plan in the works. All these plans in the works, but nothing is changing. Give us your sort of this morning's overview now that you see what is not happening. Well, I think right now we all recognize that what's going on in Haiti is actually a national security issue for all of us. Mm -hmm. But the amount of suffering that has been going on for the last year and a half has really just been absorbent. And so what we're trying to do right now is security. Security is number one. And so that's why it's important that that multinational force is well-funded. And so we're trying to work to make sure we get that funding out for them. So the multinational force you're talking about is the one Kenyan-led multinational force? Yes that is is really st stalling it's st stalling it is stalling well one of the biggest problems we have with the multinational force right now is for congress to release the funding the fund has already been um, appropriated the funds have already been agreed to by the administration but we have some republicans who are holding up releasing the funds the um, they have been telling us that they're not getting all the information but we've been rushing to get the information and this holdup has been actually since october well, I, I know this week, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said there was $300 million allocated. It's 200 and 100 off the top of my head. I can't remember mm -hmm. which part, but, but solely dedicated to this effort. Mm -hmm. Well, altogether, it's $300 million for the effort, and $33 million is going to go towards humanitarian aid because so many people are facing a famine. So we, they requested $50 million initially to start the process, and the $40 million is being held up. So only $10 million has been allocated. And what's terrible about, about the situation is that the international community has actually put their money forth. We are the only ones holding up our half of the bargain. So bring it home for me. I mean, you, you have family there and, and friends there. Have you spoken to them? What is, you know, we're watching, CNN actually has the first reporter on the ground there this morning. We're starting to get that video and, and see, and there are neighborhoods there reporting 
that neighbors and communities are fortifying their own streets yeah. against yeah. these gangs. What, what are you hearing from um, your loved ones? It's heart-wrenching to hear from your family the fear they have. I um, have family members who are saying that they have their guns in their room to protect themselves, mm -hmm. and the Haitian people are just crying out for help. And the truth is the gangs are getting stronger, and that's why it's so important that the United States takes a really affirmative stance because we can't allow in our backyards for gangs to feel like they're stronger. Tell, tell me what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. Do you mean boots on the ground? Marines are there mm -hmm. uh, to help with evacuations, not in, in a fight. Mm -hmm. But what, what do you mean by the U.S. has to help? Well, speaking. we have to make sure the funding is there, but take a strong stance as Americans that we're not going to allow gangs or the gang element to be in our backyard and to take over. We've been seeing propaganda videos of the gangs where they have ammunitions in their arms waiting for this force, but for them to think that they can actually terrorize people in our backyards, Haitian people, that they can actually have drugs going through Haiti into the United States is unfathomable. We have to actually show who we are as leaders of the free world that we will not tolerate in our backyards for gangs to take any government. So let's talk about those gangs for a minute. We've been calling them gangs. The, the different people that we've had here talking about it call them warlords, armed militias. Mm -hmm. how, how do you describe these, these gangs? It's a kind of a loose federation mm -hmm. of different factions under one umbrella and one de facto leader, Jimmy mm -hmm. Cherizier, who's called Barbecue on mm -hmm. the streets. Um, he, he clearly is in control at right. the moment. Well, I personally call them terrorists. They've been terrorizing the Haitian people for more than a year and a half. Even Americans who've been going to Haiti, they've been kidnapping them. We've seen that sex has been used as a violence, ag violence against them when rape, raping family members. So they're actually terrorizing anyone who comes into the country. So, so they are publicly saying now, mm -hmm. They are not going to participate in a transitional government. They want amnesty. They want some kind of control. What, what do you see playing out on, you know, what their issue is, is they don't see government there or mm -hmm. here as helpful to the people. And, and I just I want to throw out there that we've interviewed some Haitian Americans here. At, we were at the consulate mm -hmm. this week who actually understand how and why these people are frustrated Maybe not, they're not behind the actions they're taking, but certainly behind the intent of getting what the government is there now out. Well, I can understand frustration, but I cannot understand lawlessness mm -hmm. that actually terrorizes and recruits children to hold huge guns when you're forcing children to get into gangs. I can't excuse that. And so one of the things that I called for this week is during the negotiations for the um, presidential council is that you have no criminal elements in that negotiation because they do want to be part of the country. They do want to run the country. But how can we have credibility with the Haitian people when we are supporting gangs and terrorists? The same people who are coming through, kicking you out of your house, killing you, raping your family, now want to run the government? Is there, a, it, this is what I've, I've heard and seen evidence of as we report, the gangs came to power really through violence mm -hmm. in the last, since the assassination of Jovenel Moise, the president. Um, prior to that, administrations in Haiti actually, in a shadowy way, kind of used these people as their own what, security force? A and I'm not sure people understand how that power didn't come from nowhere. Right. I mean, it was something that was building up even after we saw um, the gangs come into play with the military and the influence there. It has been something that has been um, slowly increasing. So it's no surprise that we're in this situation. But what we have to focus on right now is how do we come out of this situation? And I think it really is going to be prevention. We have to look at the root cause today. The root cause today is instability and not a real government. So if we can get the funding for the MSS, get that transitional government, that will start giving us a four-way movement. But if we sit back and start fortifying our borders and saying, hey, let's make sure that we send you know, extra troops to the shoreways. I think what we're doing there is kind of like wishing for help or wishing for something not to happen, but it's going to happen. So I've been calling on all of the Republican colleagues, my Republican colleagues, and even the governor to join us in pushing the Republicans to release the funding, because that's how we would prevent the issue, by dealing with the root cause. All right, Congresswoman, we have a, a break, a quick break. I, I do want to talk a little bit about the expectation of that kind of exodus when we come back. Stay tuned. We will back Welcome back. We are continuing our conversation with Congresswoman Sheila Sherfalis McCormick about 
Haiti and the very up-to-the-minute crisis that is reverberating in South Florida this week. We reported this week, mm -hmm. uh, despite ramping up of efforts on both the federal and state level, which we'll talk about also with a state rep in the next segment, um, that there is no sign, no intel, no evidence of a mass exodus at this point. Have, mm -hmm. have things changed, do you know, differently? No, there's no signs of it. What we're really looking at is preventing it. And the reason why is because the situation on the ground is so dire. You have people who have been stuck in their house now for almost mm -hmm. 11 days, and they're running out of food, they're running out of water. And so people are looking at just the compounding nature of what's going on, and we're trying to prepare for the worst. So people, I mean, when you speak to people, what, daily there? Yes. Do they? want to leave? Is that something that they're looking to for their own safety or did they really have faith that they can wait it out? Well, no one wants to leave their homeland, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has faith and that's why everyone's watching the news, trying to hear of hope, any sign of hope. Any conversation we have in the U.S. really does give hope to people of Haiti. So we are really trying to do everything we can to help Haiti and let them know that we are in the works of helping them. So no one has to leave their home. No one has to take to the sea. Th taking to the sea is really a, a gamble for anyone in their entire family oh, because you can literally die more likely than not you will not survive that trip and well, so yeah I don't mean to interrupt you but we certainly have I mean I don't know if we can queue up video but mm -hmm. we certainly have covered over and over in just this week 64 Haitian nationals were repatriated intercepted off the Bahamas in a boat that we, we didn't see them on the boat we saw the boat and if five people were on the boat it looked like it might have been crowded and that's hugely dangerous exactly so most people know the reality of it and they're just waiting for that hope and we can give it to them. Like I mentioned, we are the leaders of the free world and we need to act like it, especially in these situations. You know, leaders of the free world, we, um, according to the UN report, supply mm -hmm. those gangs with most of their firepower and mm -hmm. guns and ammunition. Is there anything being done to take a look at that research last year mm -hmm. and, and stop that? Definitely, uh, one of the things that I did, I took a tour of the Port of Miami to see what can we do to stop the guns from going. Well, it's the Miami River where yeah. they go yes. from. The port has high-tech security, right. river not so much. So we took a tour of the entire um, space and we were looking at how can we fund to have more technology there? What can we do working with the government also in Haiti and the Dominican Republic so that they can be captured? So whatever slips through our hands here, we can capture it there. And so looking at the dynamics of what's going on, the thing that surprised me the most is that when it leaves here, if we can't find them, um, it actually goes to the Haitian government and they receive it. So my question became immediately is how can the actual police force have less guns than the gangs when the Haitian government receives it? And so that kind of rung bells for me about the corruption going on. But on this side, we're doing everything we can to have more um, technology to actually capture it before it goes out. Can, can we go back to that and yes. sort of flesh that out a little yes. bit? The Haitian government receives illicit weaponry, contraband, mm -hmm. and the gangs on the streets have them. Connect those dots. So that's what I wanted to find out because let's say some guns slip through our fingers here with our technology. Once it gets to the port, the Haitian government has the right and the responsibility to actually go in and search. And whatever they confiscate is supposed to go into the hands of the actual government. So that's when I started digging a little further. So how is it that the gangs have this type of ammunition? How, do th how are they outpacing, when it comes to ammunition, the government? And so that's when you start wondering about the complicity of the Haitian government. Um, even the prime minister, what's really going on here? And this has been going on now for more than a year and a half. And that's where you saw the calls for um, Prime Minister Ariel Henry to step down because a lot of things weren't adding up, especially when it came to security and the strength of the gangs. How were they getting so strong in so that time period? So then how, you know, pr prognosticate that out into mm -hmm. the future how does this transitional government, if it ever gets into place, a nine-member panel, mm -hmm. civil society, possibly religious leaders, business people, how do you prevent mm -hmm. the chronic corruption like that? Well, first step is to make sure you don't have any gang members who are, or affiliates who are on that board. And so that was one of the first things we started calling out for. Now, I, I believe that we are going to have this, um, this transition government completed very soon. And once we have credible people at the table who would actually hold responsibility, that's where we feel more empowered that they'll do the right thing. But until now, we haven't really had credible people at the table who people see as legitimate and who people actually believe in. And so that's what the hope is with this panel. Can you uh, break a little news with us? Do you know anybody who might be on that transitional government yet? I cannot. You, you know, but you can't say. I cannot say. Okay, fair enough. I respect that. 
Um, but, but you know I'll be asking you again <laughs> soon. Um, if we have a couple of minutes, we do. Um, I want to ask you about another huge news topic, the vote mm -hmm. in Congress yes. overwhelmingly to ban TikTok from U.S. app companies if mm -hmm. it does not divest its Chinese owner, mm -hmm. ByteDance. You voted yes. Yes. And this was a really interesting vote because there are Republicans who voted no. There are Democrats like you who voted yes. Mm -hmm. What was behind that vote? Well, national security. When we see our relationship with China, especially the adverse relationship that's growing even exponentially every single day, we knew that, or I knew, that we need to protect our children. We need to protect all Americans from propaganda that might be coming through TikTok. And so having um, the Chinese having them divest from any Chinese investors or the government is so imperative to make sure that we are protecting ourselves from a national security point. And that's why I voted yes to it. Not to say that we're banning TikTok, because that's not it. But if you're going to be sending out information and influencing the United States, we have to protect ourselves from a national security perspective. And, and TikTok, I, I guess part of your conversation and your decision was the immense amount of business done on TikTok. Mm -hmm. um, U.S. markets are on TikTok. TikTok here employs tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And how did that play into that decision? Well, it played into not just the employees, but also their influence on our children, influence on us and how we live as Americans. And so we have to be able to protect ourselves the same way that China protects itself, the way that the rest of the world protects themselves. And so when we realize that there could be a potential risk to national security, we have to take those affirmative steps. And with the C Chinese Communist Party being involved in TikTok, I mean, we're just sitting ducks at that point. We're just hoping they don't use their influence, which we should never be in a position of hoping we need to ensure that national security is first and that no one could have that influence on us if they choose to use it. You know, that is just one component of a very big issue, this election of misinformation. You see that on X and Twitter and Facebook and on the streets and my own very smart friends and yeah. it's, it's a bit scary. We see it every yeah. single day. It's interesting because, you know, I have uh, teenagers and kids in college and before that vote, my daughter called me and she said to me, hey mom, how are you voting on this bill? And I said, what? She you was lobbying you. Right. <laughs> so that's exactly what I said to her. And then she started telling me how this is a violation of her First Amendment rights. Mm. And I said, who was telling you to do this? She was literally reading the script that she saw on TikTok before she entered. Wow. And so I said, this is the impact we're talking of, which could be positive. I think that everybody needs to learn how to advocate and we need every generation involved. However, what if the Chinese uh, Communist Party decided to influence our communities, our children in a different way? You know, so that's what we have to be thinking that this may be positive because you're getting everyone involved, but what if they choose to use it for negative things? And that's where we said, no, you must divest. Something that we should be thinking of with every little thing. Is exactly. Here. Congresswoman yes. Sheila Sherfelis McCormick, great to have you at the table with us. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. All right. And up next, the governor cites looming threats as he signs three new laws targeting migrants. South Florida, again, center stage for border politics with Representative Dottie Joseph next. Signed times three, three new state laws aimed at illegal entry and undocumented people in Florida. With the backdrop of a growing crisis in Haiti, the governor signed off on stricter penalties for migrants who have re-entered after deportation, committed crimes, and that also bans right. undocumented people from believe. using U.S. Yeah. identification. State Representative Dottie Joseph and most Democrats voted against those bills. The Democrat from North Miami right here with us live to get into why. Good morning, State Rep. Joseph. Good morning, Madam Milberg. <laughs> Good to have you here. So um, this week, that the Florida response to what we've seen going on in Haiti is to ramp up what already has been in operation, a sort of a, a preemption, looking for people who might be leaving, who to intercept, who might be coming to the United States. You, you really question that. So ex explain that. What's your question? I mean, my question is really, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we when I say we, specifically the governor, is he trying to just do more political posturing or is he actually trying to help the problem either on the front end or on the back end? Um, if it's the latter, if he's actually trying to help resolve the crisis, then what he's doing on the front end is not helpful. So that when, when you say solve the crisis, you kind of pra flesh that out for me. You mean the practical humanitarian crisis that would make people need to or want to leave? So on the front end, 
that would mean what's going on in Haiti. As you've already discussed with Congresswoman and Chef Phillips McCormick about the guns, he could help contribute to um, helping screen with the gun flow. You guys talked about the ports um, and also the Miami River, which is a lot less secure. There are things that we could do to supplement our law enforcement here in Florida to curb the flow of guns since most of them are coming from Florida. That's one piece. On, on the other piece, what he could do um, on the back end, if you will, for people who are already in crisis and looking to leave, he could help supplement what's going on in terms of processing people in a legal and humane way. Sometimes I think a lot of my um, Republican colleagues, not all of them, but quite a few engage in this um, culture war uh, Jedi mind trick of trying to conflate legal and illegal immigration, because for them, they don't really know a difference sometimes. And I want to give people the benefit of the doubt and just assume that it's because of ignorance of immigration laws. Um, but there is a potential that some of that, um, there's some malicious intent politically in some of that conflation that's born from xenophobia. What do I mean by that? In order for somebody to legally enter the country, if they're asserting, for example, asylum, they have to present their, themselves at a port of entry. In doing that, they need to be in the country to do it. So if you intercept them and see and do not allow them to present their potentially credible claim, then you're obfuscating actual justice under both U.S. laws and our treaty obligations internationally. So... so Yes. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I really want to address what you're just saying. So yeah. you are bringing up the absolutely essential dilemma on how to help people truly in need and secure the borders against bad actors. And in the press conference today and, and before, there were several instances brought up, including one of your colleagues whose son was killed by a DUI driver who had re-entered the country, your colleagues in the state house. Um, the rep from Jacksonville, her son was killed by an, uh, a person here who had been deported and snuck back in. So there are absolutely in, uh, instances where there is a criminal element in that security concern. So that, that so allow me to push back that on that narrative very, very forcefully, but um, respectfully. Go ahead. What do I mean by that? So this woman, uh, my colleague, lost her son in a car accident. I have been in a car accident with many people, all of whom have been US nationals. So to try to extrapolate and say, because of this one instance, all of a sudden, it's there's a criminal element with immigrants is, I wanna say just wrong. Because if you look at the statistics, people who are more engaged to be involved in crimes or criminal activity are native born people from the United States. Will you find some people who happen to be migrants, um, whether they're documented or not, who are who are engaged in some kind of criminal act activity? Absolutely, but that doesn't mean that all of a sudden all crim all immigrants are criminal. No, in of fact, course, of course. Statistics show just the opposite. Of no, course, you say of course, but the the thing is the the social psychological linking of migration with immigration, migration with criminality is something that I need to definitely try to clarify because that's part of the political gamesmanship that my colleagues play that needs to stop. Point, point well taken, valid point, but that was not the only instance. There, there are plenty of other instances. The, the other instance just this week that they brought up was this boat that was stopped off Sebastian. It, looked, it actually looks like a trafficking operation that had guns aboard, that had drugs aboard. So to your point, there needs to be that kind of separate and, and unequal attention to helping two very different problems that should definitely not be conflated. And yet there is a law and order sense to the current administration that is focusing on, at least in, in this particular issue, focusing Let's on law Let's take your order. example, the example you just gave now, for example. So a, a better way to do this in a humane way that's in accordance with laws that we have would be to make sure that as you're intercepting these people, whether it's at sea or anywhere else, that you are adequately processing their claims. What does that mean? So let's say this boat of people, I don't, I don't know them, I haven't spoken to them, I don't even know who they are, but let's say that there was some smuggling going on. You would hold those people responsible for the smuggling operations, but then you have to address how you, how, how, 
assess how you deal with the actual victims, right? So that would be making sure that you have people there to translate what's actually going on and interview them separate from the purported smuggler. You have to make sure you're understanding what's going on. And these are things that neither you or I are, are um, equipped to do. These are things that need to do be done in accordance with law, just as with the judge. So we have asylum officers that need resources, but Republicans in Congress have blocked the funds because they're you know, prospective presidential candidate has told them to stand down and not fix the issue. So if we wanted to fix the issue, both at the border or at our shores, we would make sure that we have equipped our federal government with adequate resources to make sure that we have boots on the ground or at the shores to process people in a humane way, in a legal way that affords them the due process to which they're entitled. Uh, before I let you go, I just want to acknowledge that you, too, have a very personal stake in this, and I just wonder how your family is and how your friends are and how are you doing? I mean, it's frustrating, right, because we have people who are um, internally displaced. I have family who normally would live in Port-au-Prince who cannot be there right now, um, and we've been able to find other places for them to be. And, you know, I have a friend of mine who's, um, you know, relative his car cousin actually was just released in you know the wave of kidnappings and what we see here is multiple issues with the quote-unquote gangs um some of them have taken into a lot of criminal activity some of them have ties to other governments in latin america and 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 it's pretty bad when it comes to drugs but then you have others who try to espouse a more populist approach and supposedly do not engage in the kidnapping. Either way, the, the situation on the ground in Haiti is complicated mm -hmm. and people want security. The question is, how do we do that in a way that respects the Haitian people's right to self-determination uh, and make sure that we do what we can to, to help people on the ground now? A question we will be at the top of our reporting as we go forward. State Rep. Dottie Joseph, great to have you on the program. Great to see you. Thank you. Up next, how did it get so nasty? Politics and personal attacks mark this week's elections in Surfside. Both candidates right here in their only television debate. Next. Surfside is a microcosm of South Florida cities. Same issues like development and traffic and rising seawaters and quality of life. Elections there are underway this week. And among them, the mayor and former mayor are in a rematch that has become a lot about personality more than policy at times. More than two years since the catastrophe of the condo collapse put Surfside in worldwide headlines. The news about it now is more about fights and cursing and personal attacks, so much drama. Both candidates right here in their only television debate, which we appreciate so much. Current Mayor Shlomo Danzinger running for re-election and a second term. His opponent is Charles Burkett, Surfside's former mayor, twice, who lost two years ago by fewer than a few dozen votes. And that is how close we get in Surfside. Welcome to the table. Um, not a formal debate, a big conversation, a lot of issues that I want to go over for the people of Surfside, but for the people of South Florida, we have a big, broad audience. But first, I want to get rid of the elephant in the room or stay with it if you like. Um, you know, it's just become really nasty in Surfside and there's finger pointing and yelling and cursing and arrest this week that people are yelling about. Um, so I want I want you to kind of detail that for me. And since you are the city mayor, Shlomo Danziger, please go first. How did, how did it get this nasty? Thank you, Glenna. Good morning. Um, I just want to say over the last couple of years, I've watched you cover a lot of important issues, anti-Semitism in the South Florida, um, the ongoing Israeli hostage crisis. I want to thank you for your work thank on you. that. Um, I, I think what you're seeing is, is, uh, you know, is, is something that has seeped down from our national politics. Mm -hmm. um, people are just so passionate about a lot of the different issues. And as a smaller town, some of the smaller issues, they get very passionate. Um, but I don't see a town divided. I see an election process which has gotten heated, but ultimately if you look around um, the Surfside community, I mean, we have 
events, we have families coming out, we have people walking the streets, going to the beach, smiling, talking to each other, so that's the city that I see. So are you, are you saying it's just what you see on the news, is that what you're saying? I think these uh, messages are, are, are pushed out a little more and promulgated because it makes great stories, hmm. but walk the streets of Surfside, you see people smiling and waving at each other, that's the city that I see. Charles Burkett, do you yes, have a same, the same vision? I, I listen, I, I think that the campaign, there are stark differences. The current mayor is a friend of the developing community. Well, we'll he, talk about all of those. We will. And I'm just saying, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, and the stark differences represent the dreams and wishes and aspirations of the residents. You know, some residents uh, think what he's promoting is good. A so lot of residents me, think it's bad. Talk, talk to me about the actual commission meetings yeah. that have devolved into bedlam. Yeah. What, his meetings, you mean? Well, um, you both, can I just say, you both have been involved. Right. Well, listen, I, I, I just think that, you know, he's got a habit of throwing people out that disagree with him. He's got a habit of using his police force. Is that true? To, well, so. you can see it on video. I mean, it doesn't have to, he doesn't have to answer that question. People have seen but, the police uh, take like people out. But I'd like to get out. on the record, do you throw people out who don't agree with you? Absolutely not. So, actually, I've had to go before ethics a few months after I was uh, elected because somebody did that same complaint. And uh, my comment to them was to go watch a video of our meetings. And I said, I'm not going to tell you which one. Just watch and listen to the rhetoric that I have to listen to when it's directed at me. And when they're done, I say thank you, and they get back up and do it again. There are rules of decorum. There are rules the way these meetings are supposed to run. Um, historically, the chair did not run the meetings those ways, and you ended up with people flipping people off are on you, camera. Are you talking about when... I, well, I, I, I yes, think it was a, the meetings were a free for all. Um, one of the objectives that I came in to do was restore decorum to our meetings. And these aren't the rules that I wrote, but they exist in our town code and Robert's Rules of Order. What, what has happened is he's weaponized the rules and he uses the rules to interrupt, to interfere, and to, to uh, just basically stifle dissent. And it, that, that's a problem because people should be able to get up, speak their piece, but if he doesn't like it, you're gone. And, you know, our meetings were a little noisy, no doubt. He was one of the people that used to come up. He, he stormed up to, you know, without even being invited, storms up, screams at commissioners, and he throws people out for that. He, he stands up and says, you will direct your comments to me, you will not speak to another commissioner, and you will not get noisy and boisterous. Well, it's funny. He did exactly that. And when he did it, I did not throw him out. I told him to please, you know, stop doing that, you know, we're going to go in regular order. We're going to go by the rules, but that wasn't good enough for him. So I, I just want to thank you for not interrupting here at all. I, I do want to take care of a very quick technical problem. So we're going to go to a quick break, and we will be back in a couple of minutes and get into a lot of policy stuff. Good. Okay. Stay tuned. All right, crisis averted. We are back with... Mayor of Surfside, Shlomo Danziger, and mayoral candidate and former mayor, Charles Burkett. Let's get into some policy issues that everyone in South Florida will sit up and say, yes, development, what some would call overdevelopment, what some would call terrible development. Um, Surfside is, what, eight blocks long and very popular with developers. Uh, a lot of development going on right now under your tenure, Mayor, that was already approved and permitted under your previous tenure as Mayor. So, um, Mayor Danziger, let's start with you. What about development here is going to be for residents and keep the quality of life? How, how are you managing that and what do you tell them? So there's two aspects, I guess. And, and might I say, I just when I looked at the financials of your campaign, a lot of real estate and development money is in your campaign. Well, I wouldn't say real estate development. I have a lot of friends that are in real estate. Okay, um, fair enough. Many of them from out of state. Um, these are friends. I haven't always lived in South Florida. I've traveled and, you know, I've lived in other states and people support me. I've built up a group of friends. Not, not so a pejorative, of just for the record. I'm just stating facts. Yep. Um, but there is, like I said, there was two, there's two aspects. There's commercial development and residential development. Um, one of the things the opposition keeps telling people is we're going to have 70-story buildings like Sunny Isles. We're going to have five-story homes. I think it's important to note that the, the zoning in Surfside has never changed, right? The homes have always been allowed 40% on the first floor and 80% of that on, on the second floor. So we've maintained that. Um, we made the process a little easier for residents to go through their permitting. As far as commercial construction, we've approved three projects. So as you said, there is a lot of commercial development going on. Um, no plans to change or upzone, and you, you have live local coming up, the state law that 
that could allow for that to happen. So two very important facts. Number one is that I live right off of Harding Avenue. You know, adjacent to Collins, there's no reason why I would ever want to build a big building to block my own light and air that me and my family get to enjoy. So we're all residents. I think people sometimes forget that. They feel like we travel in from Coral Gables or something, you know, be mayor for a few hours and go back home. But we live in this city, so there's no reason why we would want to change it. Um, live local. I was the first and only mayor to, uh, to go out and uh, up to the state and try to, you know, stop the project understanding the, the, you know, the side effect and the unintended consequences that these kinds of legislations have on smaller municipalities. D denser buildings. Um, Let me give uh, Charles Burkett, I want to give you an opportunity. It's TV. We're very tight on time here, and I want to okay. keep it going and give you the opportunity to talk about um, the same thing, development. Yeah, listen, and, uh, there's a thing called... And, and as long as I was talking about financials, just let me say that your financials, half of the money, almost, or uh, about half the money, is your own, your right. own loan. Right. I feel strongly about what's going on in Surfside. You know, there's a thing called uh, talking the talk and walking the walk. This man talks about not making higher buildings. Uh, his planning board has put forward a proposal to more than double the sizes of buildings on... Harding Avenue. This man has gone to Tallahassee. Is the zoning there for that? The zoning is not there for that, but he's working hard to change it. He's working hard. He's putting forward a proposal to continue to split lots in Surfside, you know, so developers can make more money. You know, you have one lot, but if you, if you divide it in two, then everybody makes more money. And he goes to bat for that. He says yes to every developer that ever asks him a question. As a matter of fact, let me finish this point. We have a project on 93rd Street that was supposed to be two stories of units. It's a three-story building with parking and two stories. He came along and, and, and crafted a beautiful plan. Now the developer has three floors of units, 50% more units. So he's doing favors. He'll tell you he's not, but the fact of the matter, he is. He, listen, he flew around the world to meet with a billionaire developer. Okay, he didn't give anybody any receipts. He didn't tell anybody. He well, refuses to this day. You're talking about the Dubai owners the Dubai guy, of the, the billionaire, Champlain right? And he's he's well, given I them mean, all kinds of benefits. We, we can talk if about can that, but to... I want to give I want to give the mayor a chance to uh, address your allegations, favors <coughs> the developers, or something else. So first of all, very humorous considering my opponent is a developer by trade. Um, I'm in system and application architecture, product development. And I, um, I own one property. Uh, that's it. So that's as well, close I think, as I get I think to question, real estate. I think the question is the the, the zoning is. So what let's it is. talk have, about the the project he mentioned. Right, the project on 93rd to 94th was previously zoned for a hotel. We were going to have wedding halls. We were going to have uh, traffic. Uh, it actually had double the units than it has now. So we've de-densified it. Um, contrary to what my opponent has said, it's not three stories of units. They have below grade parking. Um, but it's two stories, and it still hits the 40-foot limitation, which has been allowed to code. We have not changed Negative. any of that. Negative. That's not true. And, you know, listen, he's going to talk right record. now because it's there's no fact. It's all public record. The, fa there, the plans exactly. are on the town website. There's no fact-checking. And, and, again, this man's reputation is say one thing and do another. He won't re provide the receipts. He won't tell anybody what he spent. He won't tell anybody who he met with. So, and so this is a problem. So for two years, the zoning has not changed. Like you said, the, the, the in walk, two years, the, walk, the zoning the has changed talk, seven true. times. Let me, okay, let, seven times. Let me um, let me just go because uh, on my list was something that I wanted to talk about, and and that is the transparency of your trip to Dubai. Um, again, this is not a pejorative or an affirmative. It is a factual question. Nobody in your town knew you had traveled to meet with the owners of the Champlain Towers to talk about the memorial. Uh, you did talk about the memorial. Why did you go? Why? What did you do there? And why not make it a more transparent trip for your residents? So to, to just go backwards a second, people did know about this trip. That was reported by the Herald, which was inaccurate. Uh, that's not what the families people, would say. That's not what the families would the say. The families that ran on Chris Cuomo to talk about me uh, with a former commissioner who's a political opponent. But if you look at the facts, um, I sat down with the families and two, two items came out of a lot of the meetings. The first was they wanted uh, part of the property to incorporate to the Moore Memorial. The second was they wanted those banners, the hostage banners, uh, not the that hostage. That wasn't the question. The, the question banners, was the receipts. The banners that was of the, the question, name. and he's uh, deflecting uh, again. Um, I, let's let him finish the question, and we can All have right. time to talk. Okay. Fair enough. The second was to get the banners of the names on the site, which was previously on a public on a private site, which was purchased by the developers to try to keep it on longer. So I did tell them that I was going to be out there on a trip to Dubai, which was planned long ahead of me actually being the mayor, 
and I've explained that at public meetings multiple times. My son had joined the IDF uh, months before I was in office. Um, I knew his graduation date. Um, so, so this so was this an trip, ancillary trip. This was an ancillary trip. I was in Dubai for five days, and I spent an hour meeting with this developer. So I was on the way out, and I said, "Can you set me up a meeting?" There's two issues I wanted to discuss. How nice. What um what is what, your what about what the receipts your, though? The re you didn't you didn't get an answer on the receipts. What is Why your is he though? hiding? He's basically hiding who he met with, when he met with them, what he spent, who paid for his trip over there. Who paid for the trip? Who paid for the trip? And I so I have been very transparent. I've even offered to give every I, I've Why would filed you every receipt. Why would the receipts? He wouldn't. I have filed every receipt as required by Florida Negative. statute that pertained well, to my Negative. business aspect of that trip. We will we will look that up. Yeah to get that. So your um, let, let's development can segue into a lot of other things. And let's talk about the uh, sea, sea level rise. Surfside yeah. is going to be on the tip of the spear of sea level rise. Yeah. And there is a plan for flooding, a plan from your administration. Um, where is that? And how would you advance well, that if, listen, it's, if it's too expensive? The current to mayor do? said I was a developer. And he's a poor little guy who knows nothing and lives in a little house on Harding Avenue, doesn't want big buildings. So uh, to be fair, I, that is that is not the characterization well, I heard in that, our conversation. Well, that, that's, that's, I think that's what everybody heard. And they, the implication was, I'm the developer, so I have all the developer friends. Well, no, I know the developers. I know how they work, okay? My development experience was, as you know, in South Beach with all the old Art Deco buildings. I restored and renovated lots and lots of those. That's my experience. Now, I own and operate commercial properties around the country, but I don't develop them. I just invest in them. So I live in Surfside. I don't make my money in Surfside. I don't have investments in Surfside. I just want Surfside to be a quaint little wonderful town like it is. I don't want guys coming along and building bigger buildings, more units. We have enough people in Surfside already. So you're campaigning we want to make it on better the platform for Surfside. of keeping everything as We want to make it better. No, I'm not. I'm not making, that's not the, exactly. I want, to, I want Surfside to be that special little hamlet that it is, and I want to continue to make it better. Okay, so we have literally a minute and a half left in okay. this segment. Can Talk I, to uh, me about, I just answer me the question about the flooding project, because that well, flooding little project, hamlet can be yeah, underwater yeah. in 30 Listen, years. Listen, when I was the mayor, we put in two projects. We had the, the, the community vote to put the power lines underground, and we voted, and we, at our commission, we hired the engineer, we put together a flooding mitigation project for Abbott Avenue, which is the worst street on our town, and we basically handed it off to this mayor, who basically took it, both projects, and put it on a shelf for two years. He's now revived it in the last couple months of his campaign to say, oh, let's have some meetings, let's have some webinars, let's talk about flooding, let's talk about undergrounding, but they've done absolutely, positively nothing. Please answer so that. These, these projects went out for RFP over eight months ago and there's a process when you do large projects like this. Um, but what they did is they underfunded these projects. They picked two projects out of the sky and they said we're going to do it and they put two million dollars towards a project that came back in after the RFP at 12 million. They funded a 40 million dollar um, bond or they, they had a 40 million dollar bond approved for a project that's probably going to come back at 90 million. So it's if I give my daughter ten dollars and tell her to go to the car dealership and buy a Toyota, that doesn't help. So see, he's complaining now, a month before the election, not a peep in the first month of his, his election. I, I think not there a are a couple of days before the election. Well, I'm just saying, but it's now Tuesday. he's talking about it. But he didn't talk about all these problems that we had. There were no problems. He's making this stuff up. But he should have been talking about this on day one. When it comes not, to you know, not now. When it comes to resilience, we had a, a debate. And one of the questions they brought up was, there was a 2019 climate study. Did you read the book? Did you implement anything? And my opponent hadn't even read it. And he was the mayor for two years after that. Yeah, that's a, We've I, implemented so multiple projects. We, we've implemented nothing. He, He's implemented nothing. Let, let me share with He's, you the, uh, the downside of, of television news is we're so tightly timed. And I think we gave everyone a really good did. taste of this race, which is Tuesday. Shlomo Danzinger Tune and Charles in. Burkett, I am grateful for you thank both you. to be Glenna, here with thank us. Thank you for inviting me. Sunday. I appreciate it. Best of luck to you both thank in your you. future thank endeavors, you. and we will be right back. So great to have you with us here this hour. Have a beautiful Sunday, and remember, keep in touch.